Hello, Bruins. This is Julie Sina. George Brown. And Chancellor Block. Hey, Chancellor. He's, he's so happy to be with us today, as we are happy to be with you. Because as George and I were just talking about, this is truly our favorite season of the year. Yes. Scholarship season. And we could not do it without our amazing alumni. So just really want to begin with gratitude. Uh, thank you so much from wherever you are, wherever you're reading scholarships, for taking the time to tend to what we believe is one of the most important things we do as a Bruin family, and that's our legacy, which is about our scholarship recipients. And as you've seen, yet again, UCLA has more applications than any school in the universe. And we all know why. Right, George? That's right. <laughs> so we really want to thank you for taking the time, for reading these amazing stories, and for helping us to select our next generation of Bruins. Really appreciate all you do and the time you're putting into this. So very grateful for you. And one of the things that we're really excited about, too, is the fact that JWEC is open. So when you do have a chance to get to Westwood, please stop by and see us. We'd love to see you in person, as would Jean. <laughs> And our students are here. In fact, our alumni scholars are downstairs right now doing a tutoring session, getting ready for finals uh, for already almost the end of uh, winter quarter. So thank you for continuing your legacy. Thank you for all you do. And we hope to see you really soon. Thank you, Julie. The only thing I else I wanted to add was um, many of you guys have watched the training videos before. And so uh, we try to change it up each year to keep you engaged and interested in what we're doing. Um, a couple of things that we did this year differently in our recruitment process for students is alumni scholars held a prospective student day or a prospective alumni scholar day. So it was for students that were interested in the scholarship, had the opportunity to come and uh, via Zoom and talk to current students. We had over 900 participants in three Zoom sessions, and they asked Wait a questions. Minute. I shouldn't be surprised by that, George. So Thank you. I take that. <laughs> um, they asked questions, they engaged with current students, and got excited about being engaged once they get to campus and getting involved. And I'll tell you, this year um, is, is just shaping up to be so inspiring to be able to connect uh, with students in a way that we haven't been able to do in the last couple of years. And we're so excited to continue that thanks to your help with the new batch of Bruins uh, this fall. Uh, the other thing that you'll notice in watching the training videos is that our partner in financial aid and scholarship, Tamara, joined us this year to actually walk volunteers through logging into the system, uh, scoring applications, inputting their scores, how to save drafts and come back and review later, all in an effort to make the process easier for you. So we hope that um, these added tips that are at, have been added to the training video will serve you well. Um, if you have questions over that weekend, myself and Tamara will make ourselves available to answer those questions for you and to make sure that you have a smooth process so we can get these Bruins to campus. And so with that, we welcome you to this season. We thank you for your dedication and your continued participation in this program. And we look forward to seeing you in the James West Alumni Center. And Gene said, he's going to wait on you. Wait, waiting for all three of us are waiting for you. <laughs> Thank you so much and go Bruins. Go Bruins. Hello there, Bruins. My name is George Brown. I'm the director of the Alumni Scholars Program here at UCLA. And it's my honor today to walk through this Alumni Scholarship Application Review Training with you for the 2022 cycle. We are excited. Uh, the campus feels back to normal. There's a buzz of students. We're starting to do more in-person events. Uh, things are, are coming together nicely. And we're so excited about this new crop of Bruins that uh, has the potential to have a normal experience their entire time here at UCLA. So before you even get started, thank you for your commitment and dedication to this review process. Without you, this program would not be possible. And so we just want to genuinely thank you uh, for your time and dedication to what we're going to do. I know many of you guys have gone through this process before and watched the training video before. So my goal is to keep it brief um, and give you just the basic nuts and bolts 
Um, so that way, if it's a review for you, it's a quick review. And if it's new information, you'll have the tools necessary to be successful in the process. So just a quick overview of what we're gonna go through today. Um, I'm gonna do a quick introduction of the three people that make this uh, program possible. Uh, we're gonna walk through the process this year. Um, and it says other volunteer opportunities and that I'm mainly going to mention uh, the review process for the transfer scholarship application. Um, and then give you an email address. So if you have questions through the process, you're able to get those answered. So thank you very much. And let's go ahead and get started. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, my name is George Brown. I'm the director of the Alumni Scholars Program. I have the privilege of serving and working with all of the students that you guys select. So at any one time, there's over 500 students on campus, uh, and I get the pleasure of working with them. Uh, some in a leadership capacity, some in just a support capacity. Um, then we have Anna Hamilton, and Anna is our program coordinator, and she helps with all of the behind the scenes logistics of the programming that we do, both the leadership development programming that we do for our scholars, um, the social programming that we do to help build community with our scholars, um, and just basic logistics for everything that happens within this program. So we're very grateful for her. And then finally, Tamara Sang, she is the mastermind behind the scenes of everything financial aid and scholarship. So um, as far as the review portal that allows you guys to uh, read these applications remotely, awarding the students and actually transferring the money out of the university accounts into their student accounts so they can pay their uh, tuition and housing expenses. All that is handled and processed by Tamara. Um, and you're actually gonna have the opportunity to meet her this year because um, one of the things that we found volunteers had questions on is how do we log into the system? When we get there, what does it look like? And so since I've never been able to walk you through that, I invited Tamara to be part of this training. And so after you hear from me, you'll actually hear from her where she'll walk you through the review process of scoring an application and uh, how to uh, troubleshoot if you run into any problems on that day. So for those of you guys that are new to the program, since 1936, Alumni Scholarships has been in existence. It started with two 150 dollar scholarships and now our scholarships range anywhere from $6,000 to $20,000 payable over the four years uh, that students are here. If they're transfer students, obviously that would be a $6,000 award and that would be paid over two years. Um, but over the years we've come to create this exceptional program that not only benefits students financially, but also has a community component to it. And that's what the Alumni Scholars Club has been. Being an alumni scholarship recipient is more than just the monetary component. Scholars are involved in campus events and organizations. Uh, they build connections with alumni. They develop their leadership skills. Um, and so when you receive an alumni scholarship, you automatically become a member of this alumni scholars club. Um, and really it's access to leadership development programming uh, anything from uh, public speaking to personal branding to networking. These are all things that we throughout the year take time to focus on and help students develop it. Um, there's alumni to student mentoring through the UCLA One system. We have the alumni mentor program. Alumni scholars get priority registration in that. So before it opens up to the campus community, the students that you help select over this weekend will actually get access to have first choice at a mentor uh, or a woman mentor to help them throughout the year. Um, there's tons of networking opportunities with UCLA alumni. Um, and then also they're eligible to receive a need-based grant. So the one thing that I think is special about our program is it is completely merit-based. So we are need blind when we make the decision of who our scholarship recipients are. Um, and just the nature of the type of university we are, some of those scholarship recipients have financial need above and beyond what they get funded through their scholarship. And so for those students, there's an opportunity for a need-based grant um, of up to an additional $5,000 per year. Um, so that really comes in handy for students that receive a scholarship, still don't know how they're gonna quite afford UCLA, 
there's this additional funding that becomes available to them. As I just mentioned in the previous slide, uh, it's a merit-based scholarship program and it's open to incoming freshmen and incoming community college transfer students. So students need to apply and be accepted into this program as new students. It's not something that you can apply for once you've come to UCLA. Uh, freshman awards range from $6,000 to $20,000, and that's paid over four years. And transfer awards are $6,000 paid over two years. Let's talk a little bit about the selection cycle this year. So the application deadline was March 4th, 2022. Uh, that's when students needed to have gone to the application portal, filled out their information and actually submitted their application. Um, the estimated date that we are going to release admission decisions is around March 18th. Um, and then that will open up the portal so students can come in and check admission decisions. And then that's when we will know which of our applicants have actually been admitted to UCLA. And we need that information before we have you start to review the process to ensure that you're only reviewing applications for students that have been admitted to the university, right? We want to make good use of your time and it makes no sense to read applications for students that unfortunately were not accepted. Um, so with that release of information being on the 18th, which is a Friday, our plan is to open up that our review portal on March 19th at 12.01 a.m. And that would stay open through March 20th until 11.59 p.m. So you'd have a two day period to review those applications. And the reason why that time is so short is because we wanna turn around and let students know that we're recipients of scholarships that same week. So the week of March 21st, somewhere uh, in between the middle and end of that week, students will already have found out if they've been selected to be an alumni scholar and what that award amount would be. Um, that's very important in the recruiting process uh, because you know, students need to have an understanding and parents as well, uh, because in most cases, they're the ones that are paying the bill. Um, they need to know what their financial aid package is gonna look like from UCLA. And as you know, with UCLA being as competitive as it is, we are competing for the best and the brightest students. And so the better financial aid package that we can present to students from the onset, the more likely they are that they can afford to come to UCLA and make this school a reality. And so we want to be as early as possible with our award decisions. So that's why they would come out the week of March 21st. Um, and that gives the student a little bit of time to decide whether or not they're coming to UCLA before they have to do their formal commitment, which is their SIR, Statement of Intent to Register on May 1st, 2022, right? So they have from when we release our decisions uh, towards the end of March, all the way until the 1st of May to decide if they're coming to UCLA. One of the things that will help them in that decision, we hope, is brewing it. And that's an opportunity for uh, admitted students to uh, find out everything that they want to know about UCLA, uh, about clubs and organizations, about resources, about programs, majors, counseling, anything that you can think of as part of that day. Um, that day is going to be virtual this year. And so uh, we are excited to be able to reach students in their homes and provide the information that they need to help make an informed decision if UCLA is the right place for them. I wanna spend a couple minutes talking about the application scoring and the rubric, okay? <clears throat> so there's gonna be several categories that you're gonna be looking at and evaluating through this process. You're gonna be looking at the students' extracurricular activities, their volunteer work and community service, that means unpaid, right? Honors and awards that they may have gotten, employment if they've had a job, had to support their family, any additional information that they may have provided, uh, special circumstances that may have happened. Are they a student that is, you know, has a single parent and needs to work, you know, 30 hours a week to help support the family? And maybe that's part of the reason why they don't have as many extracurricular activities as one might expect. And then they write two short essays. So all of that together is what you are going to be evaluating. 
And we've put together a rubric for you that gives you some scoring parameters. So extracurricular activities and community services, uh, the bulk of their application score, that's worth 50 points. Their honors and awards are worth 10 points and their essays are worth 20 points each for a total of 40 points. So when you add all that up, you get to 100. And um, let me give you some more detail about that, the breakdown of those categories. So this is what your rubric is gonna look like. And uh, Tamara will show you, in addition to the email that I sent you with this training link on it that has this document attached as a PDF, so you can print it out if you want, You'll also be able to view this document from the review application review portal. Um, so Tamara will demonstrate how to do that for you, um, but you'll have that document access to it in two ways. One, uh, print it out from the email that I sent you, or number two, when you're in the portal, you'll be able to actually access this document. So as far as extracurricular activities and community service, it seems pretty self-explanatory, but what you're gonna be looking at is you know, what was the student's depth, depth of involvement? Were they just a member of the organization or did they start the organization? Have they been an officer in the organization? Were they a president, a vice president, a finance chair, you know, a program chair? What was their role within that? And within that particular activity, is it something that they tried once and let go and didn't really have much involvement or is it something that they continued progression in over the time that they've been either in high school or their community college. So we're really looking at what was that student's commitment and involvement in any of the, the uh, activities that they listed. Um, because what you'll find is most of the students that you're going to review have a ton of activities, right? Um, so what is really going to differentiate those leaders um, from just the exceptional everyday student that gets admitted to UCLA. So we really want to see students that show initiative in what they're doing, they're self-aware, um, and they have really taken on an expanded role in whatever they've involved themselves in. Honors and awards. So that's pretty self-explanatory as well. Um, the one thing that you'll find uh, also as an attachment in the email that I sent you, and accessible through the application review portal um, is a glossary of terms or glossary of honors and awards. And basically it's a list with a description of many of the honors and awards that you'll see students list. Um, so we've compiled that list over the years. It's not gonna have everything because things change from year to year, but we do our best to update that information and give you the most up-to-date version that we can. Uh, so I invite you, if a student lists something that you don't quite understand, um, check that list first, um, and hopefully that will provide you with a description. The other thing that you can do is Google it, and more often than not, you'll find some general information about whatever it is they listed so you can get a good understanding. Um, the other thing that you're going to want to do is compare the honors and awards of the students that you're reviewing. So if you see the same honor and award, if say you have 10 applications to review and all 10 of these students have this honor and award, um, it's obviously not that significant, right? So now if you have nine applications or 10 applications and only one student has this award, um, then the chances are that award is a little bit more selective. Um, so, you know, between that, and the guide that we provide as far as the description of the honors and awards, that should be helpful to you in determining where you want to give that student uh, a point score between zero and 10. The next session is your essays. Each essay individually is worth 20 points. Um, and what you're going to be looking at is, is the response thoughtful? Does the uh, applicant just demonstrate passion for leadership and service? Um, was the essay thought provoking? Was it well written? Does it appear that the students spent some time? Um, or is it something that they just threw together at the last minute? And you're going to want to score those applications, I'm sorry, those essays separately. So if they have one really great essay and one essay that's lousy, they wouldn't get, you know, 40 points. So it's 20 points per essay. So if essay number one is good, 
you know, they may get 15 or 20 points. And if essay number two is weak, they might only get five points for that essay. But you can't transfer the points from essay to essay. Hopefully that makes sense. So if you add all of those up, that takes you to anywhere between zero and 100 points. And you're going to want to score students in whole numbers, right? We don't need 0.5 and all of that kind of stuff. Um, it just complicates things. And in fact, I don't think the system will accept it. So you want to score in whole numbers. And then that is going to allow you to move on to your next applicant. So a couple of things to keep in mind when you're going through the scoring process. The first one is to try to remain consistent in your scoring methodology, right? So if you are going to say, you know, if this student, <coughs> excuse me, um, has not demonstrated any honors and awards in their application, and you know, you're going to give that student a zero, make sure that any student that falls into that category um, would receive that same score. So you want to make sure that through this process, you are uh, looking at each individual application, but holding each application to the same standard. You shouldn't be changing your standards in between applicants, okay? Um, as I mentioned before, utilize your glossary of extracurricular activities and awards. Um, and I advise you to go through a number of your applications before you start giving hard scores. Because in the beginning, all the applicants will probably be impressive, right? Um, <clears throat> and so it's very easy to read application one and say, wow, this student was amazing, and give them a 98. And then you read application number two, and you're just blown away. And now applicant number one isn't quite as impressive because you start to see the caliber of student that you're working with or that you're scoring. So I would invite you to read through, you know, several of the applications to get a, a great understanding of the type of student you're awarding and then start to go in and put those scores. <coughs> Excuse me. The other thing that I want to remind you is until you've submitted, um, you can change your score. So your scores aren't finalized until you've submitted. Um, so if after reading an applicant, you want to reevaluate, you have the ability to do that. The other thing is keep an eye out for um, circumstances that may have made it more challenging for students to, um, to do well, right? So if a student is forced to work 40 hours a week to help support their family, they're not going to have 20 hours a week to do extracurricular activities and keep their grades up. So you just want to make sure that you're thoughtful to the student as a whole. And your strong applicants will be able to take this opportunity and really paint a picture of who they are and their experience that they had you know, through high school or their community college. And those are the students that are gonna do well in this process because the better they are to describe their activities, their circumstances, who they are as an individual to you guys as readers, the better off they're gonna score and you know, the more positive this process is going to be for them. Um, and then finally, as far as the essays are concerned, are there responses um, enhancing the application or are they rehashing the application? So have they just used the essay to kind of relist all of the things that they put in their extracurricular activities in their honors awards? Or have they provided you with new information that is giving you more insight to who they are as individuals? So if you have questions, um, what you're going to want to do is send an email to us, um, and that email is going to go to ahamilton at support.ucla.edu, and our logistics master that I had mentioned in the beginning of this training, Anna Hamilton, uh, will then either answer your email or forward it to Tamara or myself um, <clears throat> in the email. Uh, that I sent out with this training link. It had some specific instructions um, on who to contact the day of or the weekend of review, right? Um, so that would be myself and Tamara. And um, the other piece of this is that I encourage you, if you've signed up and you've watched the video and you've agreed to participate, um, please do so. And if your plans change, which sometimes they do, just let us know before that weekend 
um, that you're unable to review. And then we can remove you from the system and reassign those applications um, to other volunteers to read. We run into problems sometimes when plans change and uh, volunteers then just take a step back and say that they can't, well, they don't say, they just don't participate. Uh, and then we end up with students that haven't had their application reviewed. And what that means is that we then have to go back and try to reassign those applications and get them read. So they have um, the same chance as somebody who had their application read by you know, five volunteers. Um, so just keep us in the loop. If your plans change and you can no longer do it, we totally understand. Just let us know ahead of time so we can have those applications reassigned and make sure that everyone has a fair uh, and equal process you know, in receiving this alumni scholarship. The final thing is, um, <clears throat> In the email that you received with the, the link to this training video, there was also a link to the volunteer certification. And the vol volunteer certification is required um, each year to ensure that we have provided a training opportunity for volunteers and that every volunteer has been given the same opportunity for success and the same information on how to advance through this process. Um, so if you click on that link, it is going to ask you for a volunteer certification password. That password is Bruin2022. So you're going to enter your name, your email address, and this password and check the box that you certify that you've completed the training video. And then you will be uh, added to the review portal to actually review applications. So if you've signed up and you watched the training video, but you don't certify, Unfortunately, your name won't move forward to the application review portal. So it's very important that we complete this step. Um, and with that, I am going to pass it on to my colleague in financial aid and scholarship, and that is Tamara Singh. Thank you very much for being here today and spending uh, part of your afternoon or evening reviewing this process with us. We are extremely excited this year and go brew. Hello everyone. We are so excited this year to be able to add a component to our training video. Um, and that is with my colleague in financial aid and scholarships, Tamara Sang. Tamara is the mastermind behind Academic Works and uh, ensures that everything works smoothly as far as the application review process is concerned. And then in the next step to actually award the students that are selected their actual scholarship. Uh, we've noticed in previous years, there have been some questions the weekend of review. Um, and when I say some questions, I mean hundreds of emails that come through. So we thought that this year we would include a component in this training video that actually allows Tamara to walk you through the process of logging into the system and scoring individual applicants. And by doing this, we hope that it cuts down the amount of questions you have the day of. Um, and before you send an email with a question, you'll have the opportunity to go back and re-review uh, this portion of the training to see if those questions are answered in this training video. So with that, I turn it over to Tamara. Thank you for being here with us today, Tamara. Hey, thank you so much, George. Um, and thank you to all of you who volunteer to read our alumni scholarship applications. We really could not do this without you. Um, so I've put a few highlights up on the screen. And basically, I just want to share with you that recruitment scholarships like our alumni scholarship program really are essential in helping us roll the very best students that have been admitted to UCLA. And some of the timing behind doing this is key. So award offers made within one week of admissions decisions are really helpful for our incoming students and their families so that they have the time they need to compare the financial aid packages they're receiving from all the schools where they have been admitted. Um, so therefore, your assistance in completing your application reviews over the weekend so we can award within that time frame is so, so appreciated. It also helps us prepare for Bruin Day events and making sure we have the time to invite students to events like the ASC Welcome Day um, that George hosts. So a few essential steps before beginning your reviews. Um, obviously, completing your training and certification process with George and the Alumni Association but also some technical things like making sure you add the email address UCLA scholarships 
at fas.ucla.edu to your safe senders list. This is where your invitation and notifications to, um, about your applications assigned to you will be coming from, and you don't want that going to spam. So if you could add that to your email address uh, list now, that would be great. And you'll be ready to go once those emails start launching. This is what um, a sample email, what that will look like when it arrives for those of you who are new. Um, it will inform you how many reviews have been assigned to you. Uh, we'll give you essential links about our reviewer contracts and it will also give you a link to begin. And just some reminders for us, because this usually is a very large application group, um, assignments can shift throughout the weekend. Um, and that is because the application is very student driven. So it is working to make sure that students' applications are read as quickly as possible to meet our minimums. Um, therefore, if you do not mark the application in some way to show that you have started to review and score it, the system may move it to another reviewer um, to make sure that application is read in a timely fashion. And I'll show you how to mark those while um, when we get into the system itself for the demonstration. We also have a brief uh, review video for you that's less than five minutes. Uh, if you do want to take a look, um, just to give yourself a refresher, the links are provided here as well. Okay. So when you click through on your activation link, it's going to bring you to our prospective student portal. And you'll see right here, there are actually two tabs on the sign-in screen. You will make sure that you're going to the references and reviewer tab when you sign in. And if you have been here before, I recommend that you do save um, your password into your browser. Um, and if it is your first time, you will set up your account the system will send you a one-time secure activation link and you will then just need uh, your personal email address and the password of your choice um, to sign in. The system will provide you guidance with all of the password security levels, you know, number of digits that you need to provide and such as you're setting things up. And then you would just click on the blue sign in button to begin reviewing. Now, if you do forget your password or and you can't remember, you just click this trouble signing in link right here. It will walk you through um, resetting your password. Or if you do try to sign in and it maxes out your tries, just wait for 10 minutes and it will let you try again as well. Um, but sometimes there are security updates throughout the year and an existing password no longer meet those minimums. So you may just want to go straight to the trouble sign in link and reset it to make sure you're meeting any new security minimums that have been set in the past year. All right, let me quick move this out of the way and we're gonna go and show you what the portal is looking like. So key here is once you sign in, it's gonna take you to this screen and unless you're a chair for the group, you'll likely just see these two columns on the left and the right. And this will provide you a description of the scholarship each year in case any changes have occurred um, since the last cycle. And then you'll see your number of assignments that have been made to you. And it will keep track as you submit your scores of how many are completed. So you'll see this zero updating as you move along. Click on this link. And it's going to give you a list of anonymized, anonymized, made anonymous numbers for the students. Um, and it'll tell you what date they've been assigned, if they are qualified, which you should only see yeses for this, and a bunch of blue buttons to begin your reviews. Let's click on the first one here. Now I have mine set to review side by side. When you enter the first time, it will not show that. You'll see this where you can see the review information. You can then click on the tab and see the application. But as you might guess, the most helpful view is to see both of these side by side. So that way you can see the sections of the application as well as that the score and the scoring range is available to you. These are set in the order um, to match these scoring categories. So for example, you see the extracurricular activities and community service come up first, and you can see right over here, this is this first category as well. 
So what we provide you at the beginning is some of the links from your the invitation email. You'll see that training video that we just offered, the contract again. You'll also see some additional materials. So you're gonna see uh, a link back to the complete alumni application training video George will provide. You're gonna see the PDF of the freshman application rating scale rubric. That is basically these categories here that have a bunch more helpful instructions on what you're looking for. And then you'll also see the holistic review glossary, which will show you a lot of the common activities, groups, awards, and things like that, which will be part of the student's applications. So I'm gonna slide this down a little bit here. If anything is hidden in these sections, you can see there's a little minus next to general application. So plus and minus, and then as well as the supplemental questions exclusively for alumni. So if you can't see the answers, just click on the button next to each area and it will expand those for you. So you're gonna start out with the student's personal information. Um, you're gonna have a confirmation that they are a freshman or a transfer student. So just double check to make sure that that looks correct since we do have the second um, reading pool coming later. And it'll give you some basic information about their prospective major and also the prospective career plans. And then it will go into the areas you really wanna focus on. So we are giving the students a chance to include up to 10 extracurricular activities and community service since this is a key component up to 50 points on the application. So then move to the next category, do the same. They can provide up to five of these for volunteer work and community service. So again, you'd be looking at both of these through this category. I tend to do the partial points as I'm going. For example, I, if I say they have 25 points for the first one, and then I say for volunteer work, if I want to give them like another 20 more, then I just, you know, so I don't have to keep track of the math while I'm going, but whatever works for you. Um, you can look at both of them before you do your score as well. Honors and awards, you can also have a maximum of five. This area is worth 10 points, so you can score between zero to 10. You see we are working in increments of one, so um, you will not be able to do half points or anything like that as well. Um, employment, internships, and research. Um, while it doesn't have its own category, um, I know that George has explained in the training video how you work these into the extracurricular activities, community service honors, and how a job can impact the scores on these two areas in particular. Uh, if they have provided any additional information or a personal statement, you'll see that here. And then the supplemental questions. You'll see a leadership quote. We've used this for a few years now. Um, and then you would come over here, I believe they're worth 20 points each. So you can score. And then again, the second leadership questions about how they uh, stood apart in students at their current learning institution is also uh, worth up to 20 points. Now it's really helpful for us if you um, add anything particular about this applicant into your reviewer comments here. It is an optional field, but it is really nice for us to fall back on later when we're reading, particularly if I have some tiebreakers I need to look at to see what your comments were um, when you're reading the application. So go ahead and please put those in here. Um, what I do recommend is that in the past, some folks have tried to do save or you move on at this point. Even if your numbers aren't set in stone here for what you would like to give as a final score, particularly, you know, we always recommend reading several applications before you score. I don't want you to lose this application that was part of your portfolio. So what I do recommend is that either you use this bookmark check here or you go ahead and submit your scores here to save this application into your portfolio. So even if you do need to come back and make any changes to it after you've read some of your other applications and decided you either wanna move this one scores up or down, you have that option. So you hit the blue submit button and then the system will move you to the next application. 
And again, you'll have a new number here and the system will reset and you will start this process over again where you can check and uncheck um, to save these until you are comfortable with the scores that you have. Now, as you work through this process, um, it will simply keep updating. I'm gonna bring you back to what that screen will look like. And I'm gonna slide down to the bottom here. Screen should be a little shorter. System is assigned everyone to me right now and you'll have you know, a small chunk of the assignments once we're done. But you can see that a few of these buttons have changed. So anything you haven't started yet will still have the blue button saying begin. But if you are in any sort of process with this, uh, with the application, even if you have saved or submitted a score, it's going to give you this finish button or an update button, something like that to indicate you can still come in up until the deadline and finalize this score. Um, our deadline is always at 11.59 p.m. on Sunday night. Um, and after that, you'll see these buttons gray out so you're not able to click through and make any changes to the application. Now, one key thing to note is that the system generally does not come back and send a confirmation email that you are done. While you will continue to get reminders if you do have open applications to review during that two days, the system only sends out messages once per day and they tend to be between midnight and one or 2 a.m., giving you a reminder about either that your assignments were made is the first one. Because of our short timeline, you might get one on a Saturday night saying how many you have left to complete or if the system has had to um, make any reassignments, for example, because as George mentioned, you know, someone had a family emergency come up and you know, had to withdraw and we've had to reassign, the system automatically reassigns these. So you might find yourself getting one or two new applications throughout the weekend. Um, as this portal tries to get those remaining student applications read. So you might finish up on Saturday, and then if you do get an email that night saying, you know, X number of applications have been assigned to you, and you're like, but I'm already done, just please click through and take a look, because it could be those are some new assignments moved from a reviewer who could no longer participate, or um, it could just be those are your remaining if you didn't have a chance to finish on the first day. Um, obviously, I recommend trying to finish as many as you can the first day if your schedule allows, just in case something like that does happen and we need you to read one or two extras on Sunday. But you'll come back and it will say you'll finally have an updated information that tells you you have completed um, the number of assignments to you. So in theory, you know, mine would say something like 246 of 246 completed. And that is how you will know that all of your assignments have been read and submitted. But you're not necessarily going to get that email um, in the past that has said you have completed all your reviews. It is a more proactive system of just giving you the indication that it is done. So that's basically how to review in our portal. And if you have any questions, you're welcome to email me at the UCLA Scholarships email address. Um, that is sending you your system notifications um, and that we provided earlier today. But um, again, um, I really appreciate you taking the time to help us with this um, since it is such a vital part of our recruitment process. Um, and we love Sam being able to see our future Bruins and see them at Bruin Day and have alumni scholarships offers already out to them. And it's so meaningful for their families when we meet with them. So again, thank you. And thank you, George, for uh, giving me the opportunity to come and talk today. I really appreciate it. Tamara, we can't thank you enough for providing this extra piece of training, which I am sure is going to be helpful to our volunteer pool. I just wanted to reiterate one thing <clears throat> at this portion, and that is the importance of your reading. Um, we understand that from the time that you register to volunteer uh, until that weekend when we open up the portal to actually review applications, sometimes plans change. Um, and if you notify that us of that 
in advance, we are able to reassign or redistribute the applications that have been assigned to you. Um, however, it becomes very challenging when um, you've signed up to read and then things change, but we don't know that and we're still expecting you to read those applications. Um, what that does is delay the process of this being completed um, and it really um, affects the student's ability to have a fair process um, during this review cycle. So the only thing that we ask from you is A, that if you have been assigned applications that you do everything in your power to complete the evaluation. And B, if your schedule changes, just let us know that in advance so we're able to make the adjustments on the back end to assure that these students have the same opportunity as those whose reviewers are available to read. Um, and then finally, I'd like to say, you know, at some years, there are as many as 2,000 volunteers reading applications, and Tamara is one person. Right, And so um, anything that you can do to review the training materials, this video, to make sure that any question that you have isn't answered um, in a way that can be solved by watching these videos would be helpful. Um, because hundreds of emails come in that day um, and it takes some time to get those responded to. So uh, that was one of the reasons why we felt that it was imperative that we provided a walkthrough of how to log into the system and submit your scores. Um, so please use this as your first line in answering your questions that review weekend. And then if you're still having problems after reviewing this information, that would be the time to reach out via email. But Tamara, on behalf of the UCLA Alumni Association, we are so grateful in everything that you've done to A, advance the pro process so our scholarships are more impactful to the students that are receiving them, um, as well as taking out time of your day to explain and walk us through the process of actually reviewing an application. And with that, uh, we will sign off and good luck on your review weekend and we are here to support you should you have any problems. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is David Sun. My pronouns are he, him, his, and I serve as the interim senior director of diversity programs and initiatives here at the UCLA Alumni Association. I'm here today to talk about how you can help us maintain a more inclusive and thoughtful alumni scholarship process. Thank you for taking the time to join me as we review ways to be more intentional in our approaches to learning more about ourselves and each other and for volunteering to read the applications of our incredible students. One of the university's many pride points is the fact that Bruins come from all walks of life and that by volunteering, you are directly helping to continue the impact of that legacy. As our diverse communities continue to grow, our goal is to ensure that they receive the support and recognition for the many accomplishments they achieve. If you are unfamiliar with us, I encourage you to visit our website. Diversity Programs and Initiatives was created a few years ago to discover ways for the association to engage with the many communities present at UCLA, as well as with our general alumni community, as we work to uplift efforts relating to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Our website not only highlights the programming we provide to do this, but also includes the different identity-based alumni networks that we support. As many of you know, UCLA values and is committed to its diverse community. But did you know that our Bruin community is actually one of the most ethnically and culturally diverse campuses in the country? But of course, when speaking about diversity, we're referring to a multitude of things in addition to race and ethnicity. For example, gender, sexual orientation, and any other life experience that contributes to the rich narratives that make up UCLA's story. We hope that you're excited to be reading about students that come from all walks of life and that you remain open to these considerations as you engage in this process. Our hope is that this video provides you with some of the ways to become more aware of any internalized thoughts you may have, as well as some basic tools to remain inclusive. With that being said, one of these tools is being critically aware of our own unconscious or implicit bias. Everyone has them, and because of that, it can be incredibly hard to identify. So how can we go about exploring our unconscious bias, particularly as we prepare to review applications where in this instance, you won't be able to talk to individuals directly, 
And you're essentially reviewing someone's life only by what they've been able to articulate about themselves through writing. So given this unique circumstance, we want you to be more aware of biases that you may have when you're looking at a piece of writing about someone else. Thankfully, as a research one institution, we have conducted and have access to a plethora of research that has explored how unconscious bias impacts us all from things like hiring processes to common interactions. What we have seen is that while unconscious bias is evident in creating unfair standards, there are many techniques available to us to minimize and intervene against it. So for today, we'll be focusing on three strategies that seek to address unconscious bias that will be relevant for our process. The first is education. The second is reflecting on your own identity and how that may impact how you think. And lastly, the third strategy will think about who you interact with. Our first strategy is education. We rely on the fact that learning is a lifelong process and that the only consistent thing about society is that we continue to expand and evolve how we come to define ourselves and others. This simple premise also holds true in the realm of diversity. So when it comes to thinking about different experiences, we need to understand that learning is never something we finish doing. One of the most helpful concepts to think about when encountering perspectives or experiences I don't understand is thinking about implicit bias. We define implicit bias as attitudes or stereotypes we may hold outside of our conscious awareness. So implicit bias isn't referring to biases you may be aware of that you're trying to conceal or suppress, but rather things you aren't even aware that you may have internalized. When we break this definition down further, attitudes can be equated to your evaluation in regards to a concept, person, place, or thing, such as what we'll be doing for this process. For the sake of this training session and for the sake of the scholarship application process, we'll be focusing on the people. So attitudes can either be positive or negative. The second part of the definition mentions stereotypes, which are beliefs that are strongly associated with a given category. Stereotypes are normally reinforced in society by media or from personal experiences you may have had with one person. They may cause you to associate that one person's identity and their individual behavior with the whole entire group they share an identity with. Some common stereotypes you may be familiar with are, Asians are good at math, men are often associated with the workplace more than women, and many other stereotypes that come to mind. The main takeaway here is that while you may personally not believe a stereotype, which is often the case when it comes to implicit bias, they can still influence the way you think and shape your worldview. So being aware of these things is crucial to helping us address unconscious bias that can occur during this process. Now, this is, of course, a very abbreviated lesson, and there will be links available along with this presentation if you want to personally learn more about it. But for the purposes of today's training, we want you to think of it as a tool to better understand how you can help us create a more inclusive process. The second strategy you can implement is self-awareness. Our decision-making is inherently informed by not only the way we process information, but also by the experiences we have as individuals, from the way we grew up to our day-to-day -day interactions and to who we keep in our social, social circles all impact the values we recognize. How this relates to unconscious bias is being able to introspectively examine and identify any biases you may have for any one given group or groups, and then taking the active effort of recognizing and minimizing its impact. However, accomplishing this is often easier said than done. There are several tests that have come out over the past years that provide a great introductory scope of helping people begin to explore what types of implicit or unconscious bias they may have. One such example is Harvard's Implicit Association Test, which you can take yourself using the following website address. 
However, I would like to note that as with any research methodology or tool, updates and peer reviews always help to strengthen and increase accuracy for practical use. Therefore, I would also recommend participants review research that has been gathered by the university's own UCLA Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Bearing in mind the new information that is available in combination with existing tools allows all of us to stay best informed in our continuing goal of being aware of unconscious bias. The last strategy we'll review today is looking at your own social network. Who we surround ourselves with both by proximity and virtually is actually one of the most powerful influencers of how our understanding of diversity is shaped. So when considering how to address bias or seeking to understand and learn more about diverse communities, thinking about this strategy can be beneficial by helping to provide a starting point with those who surround you in your life. It can be difficult to attempt to learn about others' authentic experiences, especially when you may not have a direct link to those communities. Logically, it makes sense that this would be the first step to take. However, learning about others outside of our immediate communities can still happen by connecting with community members we identify with as well. So for example, if I identify personally as Asian American, I can connect with other Asian Americans to better understand how our race has shaped my larger perspective of race and race relations. It's also a space to allow myself to think of groups I am not a member of. Speaking to members of communities you do belong with in combination of those you do not provides a more holistic perspective to how you can better be an ally by viewing where gaps may be between perceptions and reality. In terms of bias, learning in the face of sameness and difference can play out as a great tool to identify areas to examine. We have 11 different identity-based alumni networks for you to connect and grow with if you're ever interested in taking that opportunity. So now combining these three different strategies, let's examine how we can apply them to the alumni scholarship process. There are a few things you can think about when you go through the reviewing process so that when you conclude your evaluation of applicants, we encourage you to assess candidates using concrete and tangible experiences in that moment. Compared to thinking about your review from an overarching perspective, really think about the information that's right in front of you. Secondly, be aware of your own biases. If you aren't personally identifying with a candidate or their experience, ask yourself if your rating is being impacted by that alone. Do you find yourself unsure because you don't know that community well to make an informed decision? So actively think about your responses and decisions that can be impacted by stereotypes and counter them with positive thoughts about individuals from groups that you may not have much experience working with or know personally. Lastly, as much as social identity is a salient part of any candidate, think about the individual as a singular and holistic person. Everyone is incredibly complex and holds multiple experiences and facets to their identity. And it's in those nuanced differences that we really want you to evaluate a candidate. What is this person sharing with us? What informs their life perspective? Now, this is not in any way, shape or form saying to be colorblind, or to ignore identities that people share, because understanding who someone is as an individual is inherently linked to how they've come to perceive and be perceived by others, and therefore an important part of their journey. So don't think solely about people's identity, but think about the ways they have expressed it and how it's impacted their path to UCLA. As I mentioned earlier, you really want to make an effort to think about the individual. Now, while this topic is something that can certainly be expanded upon, we hope you find it helpful as you begin the process. As always, we are available for questions and support, and you can find my contact information. Um, and again, thank you for joining me today and thinking about how to help us build a more inclusive scholarship process. We appreciate you all. Thank you.